very happy to see quite, quite some people here. So uh, you made it uh, to the to the afternoon. So I believe you very much like crypto and you are interested in the different topics. Uh, before we kick off, I would like to uh, um, invite the panel. Please have a seat already, so I can introduce you and then we can kick off. In the meanwhile, I to explain a little bit what, who am I, what I am doing, and why I'm standing today in front of you. So by now, you probably know already what is the CVA. Um, we have different working groups, and I, uh, in my volunteer time, chair the working group education. In this working group, we organize webinars, everything in and around education. And we have a flagship um, project, which is the annual research journal, and where we would define a topic invite or, or let dedicated authors and professionals apply and, and join this sort of call for papers. And if you're an author, you can uh, write from the perspective of technology, you can write in the perspective of legal, and um, it's already the third uh, year where we announce uh, this year's topic. And um, hence we have this panel on payments today. This year's research call is on payment and settlement net networks. You will later on after the conference see all the social media announcement, but now we kick off today officially at the CVC conference with our payment panel. Hence we want to talk about payments, we, we, we put together quite, quite an interesting panel with, with um, three, three different high caliber representatives. Um, before we kick off, uh, I'd like to invite the author, uh, the, 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 the speakers, to quickly introduce yourself so the, the audience know who you are, what you do, and which, which company you represent today. If you'd like to start, Daniel, since you sit on my side. <laughs> sure, thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm Dan Capraro, Chief Product Officer at The Appeal and one of the co-founders. So we founded The Appeal 2018 as a pure B2C wallet in the TreadFi environment. Uh, we build up our own tech stack. We, have, uh, or we hold our own license in regard of uh, uh, fintech license and uh, um, a license for issuing cards. So we are the principal member of Visa gives us the opportunity to issue cards for ourselves and for any, party, any third party. Uh, hi, my name is Maria. I'm a business development manager for the company Virestro. Uh, Virestro is a vendor and venture of MasterCard and we are providing MasterCard and Visa solutions to fintechs and crypto companies. Hi, I'm Jess Holgrave. I'm the CEO at Wallet Connect. Um, Wallet Connect is an open source project that connects apps and wallets uh, in an off-chain end-to-end encrypted way uh, to send messages between each other. Um, prior to this, I was running the crypto team at Checkout.com, which is a global payments company, and I sit on the Bank of England advisory board for central bank digital currencies. So payments are very close to my heart. So as, as you can already see, high caliber panel, everyone with their own project and, and company here. So we can all agree that blockchain technology, hence the, the origin of Bitcoin, most of the application we also see here in Switzerland are related to investment products, right? I think also in terms of geographics, on continental Europe, we have a functioning IBAN system, right? We, we kind of can trust the system, um, maybe here, here are some bits and bobs here which we can improve, but if we then look at the new application on blockchain, or maybe even in a different geographic location, let's say Latin America, where you have plenty of fragmented countries that do not communicate with which is other, their payments or payment rails become increasingly important are actually the new go-to uh, application on blockchain technology. Maybe Jess, um, as, you, as you just uh, sp spoke last, where do you see the current challenges in the payment system and, and settlement networks? So I think that there's a, there's a few things. Firstly, the technology that most of these old systems are built on is very antiquated. The SWIFT messaging system, which is um, 8503, is, if you've ever tried even just looking at the code, it's, it's a brain rot. Um, so for companies to recruit engineers who want to work on this tech stack, it's, it's very challenging. Um, and it's complex to maintain these old payment processes and, and work with the Visa and MasterCard and SWIFT networks. 
Um, so there's a, there's a technical challenge in, in that regard. There's also just a number of other challenges in terms of the efficiency of that, in terms of where the how the data is stored, the complexity of data storage, and, and the amount of storage that that takes. Many of these systems don't talk to one another, um, and so you end up with fragmented, uh, fragmented systems that um, don't work, particularly in a cross-border method. I often use the example, like if you've ever tried to send a small amount of US dollars from the US to somewhere in Africa, or actually even worse, if you've tried to send currency from one African country to another, a lot of that clears through London, for example. Um, and what you end up with is that $100 becoming 75, and all of these rent extractive parties who add maybe some value, but I, I find it hard to justify 25% of the transaction taking taking rent out of that system. And the people that are most impacted by this are the people who need it the most. Um, we're talking about creators, we're talking about um, people doing gig economy work for whom that extra $25 is incredibly significant. And so I think we have with this new payment rail opportunity with blockchain an ability to recreate something that can be lent less rent extractive for people. Absolutely, I, I can just join on, on what you said, and I, I like to double tap on the inefficiency when, when you send money cross border, especially when the fees are so high. Uh, there are different layers of intermediate uh, banks who, who take the card, they, they process, it takes some time. In my professional occupation, I, I work in payments as well, and we specialize or focus on Latin America, so exactly what you said, when you then try to send funds to, to Europe from, from Brazil in this case, this takes days, weeks, a lot of compliance work. Sometimes you don't know where the funds are. They're somewhere stuck in the middle, and it's a huge issue. Um, what do you think, Mariah, about th those challenges, especially now that, that you said Mastercard, Viestro background? How, how do you see blockchain technology overcoming those those inefficiencies? Well, I, I would like to add actually that indeed there is um, a huge issue with uh, cross-border uh, transactions and um, it's related a lot to regulatory issues and uh, G20 uh, set a roadmap in order to um, streamline the cross-border uh, transactions and make them cheaper and faster. And it looks like that uh, near future, in the near future, there would be these pockets of uh, interoperability within regions like Asian uh, region, for example, where um, there would be improvements on cross-border transactions. Uh, for example, in um, 2023, there was this initiative between uh, the government of Singapore and India to create uh, the network of um, banks, um, that, and participating banks will uh, have a much smoother and faster operations on cross-border transactions. And apart from it, there is also uh, problem with digital borders, uh, the problems of uh, inter interoperability between um, large digital um, platforms. Uh, for example, uh, the users of Alipay cannot send money to users of Meta, and there are some actions that should be taken around this as well. Absolutely, I think one one big advantage, or let's let's put, rather put it this way, I think that you know blockchain technology will probably not yet totally re replace the, the the financial system of today. It rather gives per use case a very good alternative. Maybe something the email did to post industry, um, what Spotify did to MP3 players, right? What what, what news blogs online did to the newspaper. I think this is a little bit where it goes, because as you say, you a client on a platform, let's say Alibaba, or we want to send, send money cross border, then you can do it in real, real time. You just sent me your QR code, uh, which is you know pretty much representing your, 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 your wallet, and in real time, I can send you money. But now, Daniel, uh, as far as I understood, you have the technical background, and uh, your company is, uh, is Swiss-focused. How, how do you look at uh, the, the uh, efficiencies or inefficiencies from, from a tech point of view? Yeah, absolutely. I just can echo what uh, my colleagues already mentioned because uh, in especially international payments is really awful today. The, those solutions which are out and there I see a huge potential for uh, Web3 technology uh, to step in. Um, then I would say from, from our point of view as we are um, performing basically on the TradFi side and are being a player for uh, embedded finance especially when it comes to 
payments and cards. So from that point of view, we would like to use our most modern technology to already enable uh, and bridging there the, the, the worlds between TradFi and uh, DeFi. So from that point of view, I see there are a lot of uh, opportunities uh, collaborating with um, DeFi companies. And from that point of view, I think that makes it then really accessible so that you can pay uh, with your um, digital assets for everyday goods, uh, for a coffee, whatever you like. And I think that's another step that we need to make those currently as investment treated funds really making accessible on an everyday spend. Clear. I think maybe to the audience also to, to maybe separate this a little bit, you have cross-border payments where we try to just to bridge the inefficiencies of the Swiss system when transferring money abroad, but then there's of course also the perspective of the user of paying with their crypto asset, let it be stablecoin, let it be BTC, ETH, you name it. Uh, I think there, there are two, two differences. Um, do, do you see from your experience, Jess, an adoption or is there a faster adoption in cross-border payments or users actually paying with crypto? So I think when we think about like use in e-commerce and the end user buying goods and services with crypto, we still don't have quite all of the infrastructure necessary to enable that in an easy way. Um, one of the reasons that card schemes are so popular for end users is because there's a ton of consumer protection mechanisms built in. Um, if I buy something and the company goes bust, um, but I want to return my broken furniture, um, there's a backstop there. The card acquirer and ultimately the card scheme will step in and, and refund that for me. Um, if I order something online and it never arrives, the card acquirer will step in. Um, if I'm subject to fraud, the card acquirer will step in. Crypto is a one-way uh, permanent transaction that has none of, none of these consumer protections. And so it might work really well, for example, for some transactions, but where I want more consumer protection, uh, it doesn't exist today. Um, similarly, until pretty recently actually, doing transactions using crypto that are cost effective and very fast and settle very quickly has also been difficult. Um, there's certainly no way you'd want to use Bitcoin to buy a coffee at the corner because by the time you actually got to drink it, it would have gone cold. Um, and so actually using crypto in, in e-commerce, I think, until today has been very challenging. We're now starting to see more and more payments companies offering this, Stripe being the latest, who reintroduced crypto payments to their payment stack uh, this quarter. Um, but there are certain, you know, there are certainly things which I think still don't make crypto necessarily the preferred instrument for developed countries' consumer uh, everyday payments. I think that will change over time as more and more companies step in to fill some of these gaps. We use things in insurance and other sort of um, other methodology. Um, and also now we have the technology using smart accounts that for the first time we can recreate pull payments um, effectively, which we've never been able to do before. And a big chunk of consumer payments are direct debit, subscription payments. And these again are only just recently being unlocked. So I think that that's likely to, to grow a lot over the, over the near term but it's, um, it's certainly very nascent. Cross-border payments, I think, is where there's a lot more traction today. Um, in this space, there's a lot more inefficiency and a lot more cost, especially if you're comparing it to uh, a developed country where you've got some form of faster payments mechanism that's already in place. So I think we'll see a big, big adoption there. And the other place that I think we'll see big adoption is, is where we've got much more of a kind of green field with respect to faster payment systems. And there are places in the world where aren't there aren't faster payment systems. Um, and where I think this technology, if you're designing something from scratch today, is, is the obvious one to use. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very much aligned with what you said. Like from a consumer perspective or cross-border perspective, there's different, let's say, level of adoption. Or how do you see it from, from your perspective or your, your appeal, Daniel? I fully agree. Uh, so basically, there's just um, this, I would say, these two hotspots. And uh, I would, I think as well, in this morning when we heard uh, the guy from Swiss National Bank speaking, there, they already have seen that this is a huge pain point, the international payment. And I think that's pretty obvious that this would might be the, the first step. Crypto costs are already there. Uh, some of them are using them quite good, which makes then uh, the, the, the digital assets accessible for everyday spending. So basically, 
there the tools would be already available and yeah just gonna make it more accessible to the the huge market then absolutely i think it, it, the user like let's let, let, let's take this example from stripe i think they 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 re-implemented the the crypto payment functionality but as far as i'm informed then the user will still need to have a meta mask and then it suddenly becomes a little bit again a problem right the, the normal user then sees some add-ons and pop-ups uh, with i think this not really help helps um uh, the the payments it should be more immediately maybe just exchanging the rails in the background so this this is more efficient but then again it's very nascent as you said jess um, there's still some time adoption if you look at bitcoin as an investment product it just arrived in switzerland and at the banks right so give it some time um Another good good thing the the panel just discussed is the consumer protection with cars. But maybe then for Maria, um, why would crypto companies would want to issue a card? Uh, are there differences in transaction volumes? How, how do you see this? Uh, well, um, first of all, a crypto card right now is one of the fastest growing payment methods that uh, actually allow crypto to enter mainstream and uh, crypto can be already used for everyday purchases. Uh, MasterCard and Visa are offering a crypto card, um, uh, and it's called crypto card, but in fact, it's a card that is transacting like any other normal card in fiat, but it can be linked to the um, uh, crypto uh, balance of the user in the crypto wallet and how it works is that uh, the partner uh, debits the crypto balance in the wallet, uh, converts crypto into fiat and then this fiat is used to transact through MasterCard or Visa card. Uh, so basically it's, it's quite a fast process and it means that Crypto is already entering mainstream through crypto card. And um, for uh, crypto companies and crypto wallets, it's a chance to improve user experience, of course. Uh, and uh, secondly, it's additional um, revenue mainstream uh, because uh, Crypto companies can uh, make money on their transactions from the card. They can charge per transaction. They can, they can also charge uh, per usage of card. And uh, they are earning money from interchange. Interchange is a scheme, a payment scheme within a MasterCard and Visa when acquirer is paying a certain fee uh, to the issuer. And uh, it's quite high for cross-border payments. It can go up to 2% per transaction for cross-border payments. Quite an expensive undertaking. I actually some, remember some time, probably two, three years ago, suddenly all larger crypto projects, let it be crypto.com, Binance, and all others, they all tried to issue cards. That was like the thing to do, right? I'm not sure if they ever arrived, or, or, or I think some, some of the offering changed back then with crypto.com, they had great cash bag uh, functionality and so forth. Um, however, um, uh, I think, again, buying something with BTC, your coffee is probably cold by the time the, the, you, 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 you get it. But then we see, all of these challenges in terms of user adoption, right? Then I, I mentioned the use case Stripe, pop-up, MetaMask, my grandma doesn't know what it is. From, from wh where do you see like improvements on technology? Should it be rather, let's say, changing the rails in the background without the user actually tell, telling them that what, what's happening? Or how do you see this? Well, basically we can see that as well, what happens uh, in, in other payment uh, industries before, um, as, as you just had complicated uh, checkout processes, uh, it, it really avoids a mass adoption. And, and as long as you need all these MetaMask and, and entering complicated addresses, and you basically need a deeper understanding of how the technology works, so long, I, or at least my assumption is that uh, it won't really step in into mass market. So it's just a tap and go. And in addition, what, what has been mentioned as well is the security on top, because I grew up in an age where uh, credit card payments on web has been really bad from a point of view, and they're only the security that has been added on top, and really that you, the, the, the cashback uh, mechanism that Jess meant before is, is really then important for the convenience and the, um, the felt security of the persons, because, uh, yeah 
no ones want to get uh, playing around with the money just on an unsecure way. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, maybe as a fireside, qu quick question, Jess, did you ever pay anything with crypto? Yes, many, many things. Um, I've tried to actually almost entirely opt out of the traditional financial system um, for many reasons, but mostly because if I'm trying to build this stuff, it's important for me that I actually use it and know how it works. I think it's also a shame to consider that the only people who can solve this are the Visa and MasterCards of the world because mm. they are the rent extractive uh, people within the current system that are under, under supporting the people who need it most. So I actually, whilst I think we've got a long way to go before the user experience is really there in terms of security and protection, mm -hmm. um, I do think that the market can deliver that in a different way. Um, I think that the wallet experience is improving. Smart accounts have a, a huge amount to, to be thanked for in terms of delivering better user protections, enabling users to set permissions on spending limits, for example, um, and providing more uh, programmable payments options where, for example, if something wasn't delivered, um, there could be a DAO-type insurance mechanism that would provide some consumer protection. So I actually disagree with Daniel a little bit that I think that the only way to do it is behind the scenes because I think that if we take that approach we've sort of admitted failure um, so I think actually yeah there's a lot that we can do to make it better and I hope that that will be where we end up Maria you did you pay anything uh, in crypto already in your in your life let it be a coffee or maybe your tax bill in Zug you know <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now there, there's um, always um, you know um, uh, good, good Good, good. It's always a good moment to, to start and try, but then now that we have actually you know three plus four, four let's say pay, payment pr provider on, on on the panel, maybe Mariah since you have the microphone already in in your hand, um, how how important do you think that institutions, let's say traditional institutions, but also new fintechs or crypto focused payment providers should collaborate in order to to move this industry forward? What do you think about this? Well, talking about payment networks, again, like MasterCard or Visa, I can see that there is lots of collaboration happening already, and there was a, a big change in terms of the um, entry barriers uh, for fintechs uh, to join the networks of MasterCard and Visa. Uh, like before, it was very complex process when you have to wait for one year of integration to the network. Uh, it required lots of human resources. It was just impossible for uh, small, uh, medium players. Uh, but now um, there is this new layer of intermediaries like like us, like Appeal, that uh, actually um, connects in fintechs and crypto companies to MasterCard and Visa networks, and it provides a very fast um, uh, entry to market because uh, practically the crypto company can issue payment cards like in three months. Thanks. So there are, yeah, I think that's a very positive change and MasterCard and Visa obviously realizing that uh, they cannot exclude um, fintechs from this space. So it's not just big traditional banks that uh, work with these networks now. I think naturally, organically, the industry grew. Um, BTC as a technology is accepted, so I can assume that uh, traditional payment processes, they would also now a little bit be a little bit more open to it, see, look at it and say, okay, look, when you have transaction costs of 2%, we can probably lower this to somewhere 10 bips or something, right? Which is a huge drop in fees, which ultimately results in what, what, what we do in, in, in the enterprise I work, we focus on computer games, so we give this discount to the user. And then you can imagine giving a $5 discount for a computer game player in Brazil is a lot of money, right? So there's the benefit benefit of the user. Then, um, I, you know, we, we should not have our monologue here down, down on the stage. Uh, I'd like to invite the audience. Is there a question? Yeah, we see already one, two, okay. Let's start. Well, in this, uh, sorry, sir, ladies first. <laughs> Who wants to volunteer? 
I can try to take that. Uh, for me, clear, it has to, because uh, it can't be that a uh, new system based on CBDC is not more effective, more uh, faster, and, and um, yeah, lowers the cost quite significantly, because basically there are no more the need of all this intermediary uh, that you have between. Um, there are clear entry and, and endpoints, and so it's a strict line and it should be relatively fast, almost instantaneously, so that you can transfer money from wherever uh, on, the, on the planet. In, in, in my experience, most CBDC teams around the world aren't really speaking to each other about the underlying technology, which is the issue here. So whilst, yeah, sure, if we were all gonna build our, our CBDCs on the same underlying rails, we could bridge these very easily. The reality is that most of them aren't doing it like that. Um, people are looking at various different permissioned systems um, and completely underlying, different underlying rails and programming languages. Um, so I think the idea that it will help with cross-border payments is, is we're maybe a little far off from. Maria, do you have one, one more comment to, to this? Or shall, do you want to answer the next question from the gentleman? Maybe in the light of the time, let's listen to the next question, please. This is rather yeah, maybe f more, more like fiat cr crypto question. Who, who, who wants to take this? I can, I can share a few thoughts. Um, most of the fiat on-ramp, if you're talking about an on-ramp process um, and you take the, it's somewhere normally between about 200 and 300 basis points that you're paying uh, a, a Western developed world, like someone like a moon pay. Um, if you break that down, um, the actual costs in there are relatively low, because the cost base is um, uh, doing a KYC check, which is normally s measured in cents. Um, it's a card acquiring fee, um, and the actual fee to the card processor is relatively low. Some of that is interchange. Um, but the margin that most um, acquirers are making on crypto transactions is incredibly high if you compare it to something like retail. Um, they will tell you that that's because there's additional fraud and things like that measures needed, but the reality is that it's not. Um, it's just there are so few card acquiring companies who are willing to process crypto because they don't understand it, that the supply and demand curve off is, is off in this space. And then there's also um, for the for the on-ramps themselves, they're taking pretty, pretty high margins there. Um, and they're doing that because they need to split those margins with distribution because there's just such big kind of competition for different, getting different stable coins out there in particular. Um, and so there's just a lot of like rent extraction out of that 300 or 400 basis points that will only come down when um, when the, those different entities get more and more comfortable with this space and can begin to actually price it more realistically from a risk perspective. Um, and when more acquirers uh, are willing to enter the space. Um, so that's one element on the on the on ramp. On the off ramp, it's a it's a little different. Also, um, I think it it's it's mispriced because the settlement risk is is almost zero um, if you're doing an off ramp. Um, and here again, I think we're just at the stage where there are so few options, realistic options in terms of off ramp that you either have to go through the card route, um, in which case your provider is taking a, a chunky fee because that's the only way that crypto wallets make money um, and they don't have other, other revenue streams. So unfortunately, in, in the light of the time, um, let's let's some concluding marks. We understood that you know, there's uh, the the element of consumer protection when it's only one-sided way, which maybe hinders the progress of of crypto payments per se. Uh, we see that since this is like a new use case, the adoption is not yet there, and also 
since we speak here from, from, the, from the perspective of the working group education, a lot of education still has to be done with, let's say, the retail clients when they pay. So maybe it's an option to just exchange the rails in the back without telling the user in the front end what actually happens in the back. They would just pay with the local alternative payment method, and then we as technology provider, we, we just you know, do the magic in the background. That being said, uh, I still would like to invite you for a little networking session just here outside uh, the, 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 the lecture room um, to ask more specific questions. And in this regard, uh, you guys have a good day, and I see you outside.